Hello, and thank you for joining our third annual Day with DESA. Before the session gets started, let's go over a few things. A copy of the presentation will be available to download once the session has ended under the materials section. If you have questions about the information in this session, enter them in the Q&A section below and the speaker will answer them once the session has ended. If we don't get to your question, we'll reach out to you at the end of the conference. If you have questions about the topics or trends that are mentioned throughout Day with DESA and how they pertain to your company, and you'd like to reach out to one of our team members directly, hit the chat icon at the bottom of daywithdesa.com and you'll be connected directly with one of our team members. Thank you for attending live. Each of our live attendees is eligible for our prize drawing at the end of the conference. And each session that you attend live increases your chances of winning either a Nintendo bundle or a brand new iPhone 12. Finally, I'd like to take this time to thank all of our sponsors for their participation today with DISA. Specifically, I'd like to call out CRL, our title sponsor for three years running. We'd like to thank our platinum sponsors, Orisher, Quest Diagnostics, Samba Safety, and Psychomedics. All of our sponsor support is greatly appreciated. With that, let's get started. Enjoy your session. Thanks for joining us today. Today's discussion is gonna be a panel discussion focused on myths and challenges of employment screening, specific to drug and alcohol testing. I'm Brendan Brown, I'll be your host today. I've been with DESA Global Solutions 15 years, and I'm currently the Vice President of Client Relations. Also on our panel today, Christina Salomon, Manager of Collection Services, Quest Diagnostics. Uh, like Brendan said, I am the Manager of Collection Services at Quest Diagnostics. I've been with Quest Diagnostics for about seven years. All seven of those years were in collection services. So I feel that that is my niche here at this company and I'm happy to be on the panel today. Faye Caldwell, legal advisor and litigator, Caldwell Everson. My name's Faye Caldwell. I'm in Houston, Texas. I'm an attorney. Um, my practice is kind of a tiny one, but it's well suited for this group. It's in drug testing, I represent employers, laboratories, medical review officers, collectors. Um, I also happen, in addition to being there in court for my clients, I also help them out with advice. I also sit on the Federal Drug Testing Advisory Board, helping advise um, the Department of Health and Human Services for issues surrounding drug testing. Thank you for having me, Brendan. Charlie Dusso, Executive Vice President, Psychomatics. Yeah, hi, Brendan. Thanks for uh, asking us to join you on the Day with DISA. Great opportunity for us. My name is Charlie Dusso. I'm the Executive Vice President of Psychomedics. And among my responsibilities is uh, sales, uh, customer care, client services uh, for Psychomedics Corporation. Abigail Potter, Manager of Safety and Occupational Health Policy with the American Trucking Association. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, Abigail Potter, I'm with the American Trucking Associations. I've been with the association for about 13 years now. I'm uh, focused primarily on um, safety issues within the trucking industry with um, a focus on medical qualifications of truck drivers um, and CDL qualifications with a you know, strong focus in drug testing. Chase McCourtney. Director of Product and Operations for Formbox. Thanks, Brendan. My name is Chase McCourtney. I'm the Director of Product and Operations at Formfox. I manage various teams, including our training and implementation team, who is in charge of onboarding all the clinics that use Formfox and teaching the collectors how to use the system effectively. I also manage our technical support team, so the team that takes the incoming calls and emails when things go wrong. And I also interface with our technical team to develop new enhancements and features in our products, such as new additional digital workflows. Thanks for having me today. Thanks, Chase. All right, first, uh, first topic uh, we want to tackle is hair testing. 
uh, versus your intestine. So Charlie, I'd like to, to start with you and by all means, if uh, there's anyone else on the panel who has some input, uh, feel free to, uh, to chime in during each uh, portion of the program. Uh, Charlie, could you give us a real brief description, maybe for some of the uh, audience members who are brand new to drug testing, uh, hair testing versus urine testing, uh, and then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. Uh, first of all, I, I should state that our most successful clients uh, who have a most comprehensive program actually use hair and urine testing side by side. Uh, there are some benefits, benefits of both. Uh, it probably makes uh, sense to give a short review on that. Um, in terms of use, urine testing uh, is the best means for post-accident uh, drug testing. Uh, you know, if a truck driver is involved in an accident and the uh, urine collection will be observed, immediately tested, you're going to see if there are drugs in that person's system. Uh, it's an observed collection, uh, and it'll tell if there are drugs in that person's system at the time. Uh, also, um, fitness of duty. Uh, so if you, if you show up at the plant gate and you're worried that uh, somebody may be under the current influence of drugs, urine testing is uh, the best solution. Hair testing um, has some benefits uh, in addition to what urine testing does. The, the biggest of which is hand testing provides a three month look back for drug use. So for those clients uh, who want to keep lifestyle users out of the workforce, uh, hair testing is the best solution for pre-employment pre uh, drug testing, as well as regular randoms. What the look back in here does, it gives you a window of about uh, 90 days of drug use. Uh, if you it, the the thing about hair testing, your hair is like a tape recorder. Uh, it records the drugs you take uh, in proportion to how much you've taken in one in when you've taken those drugs. And because of that look back period, uh, another major benefit of here is the deterrence impact that it has uh, over urine. So, what would you uh, what would you say to employers who? believe that they, uh, they want to move forward with both urine and hair uh, so they can capture kind of the best of, of both worlds as it pertains to, to screening employees. From, a, from an awareness perspective, what would your guidance be to, to that employer? Yeah, from an awareness perspective, we find that clients who are transparent about what they're doing and why they're doing it are the most uh, successful. Uh, because here provides that longer look back period, you know, uh, oftentimes our, our clients will send out uh, educational pamphlets or brochures, you know, or do town hall meetings discussing the differences between uh, urinalysis and hair testing and why they're using both. You know, that way it, it, it limits the challenges. Uh, and the other thing is, or what we find is uh, those companies who promote that they're using both uh, urine and hair testing in a pre-employment sense uh, tend to weed out uh, some potentially undesirable uh, applicants uh, to their pool. Okay. Uh, next, next item, and, and Faye, you may have some, uh, some input here, you may not, but uh, uh, if you're running multiple programs as the employer, uh, you know, A, is it, is it plausible that the individual uh, may be positive for one test, negative for another, based on different methodologies. And B, what's uh, you know next steps? Uh, what what would be required, uh, I guess, by the employer in that scenario? Sure, Brendan. This is one that I think a lot of donors want to argue about. Uh, I went, I was positive on a hair test, and went out and got a urine test, and it was negative, or vice versa. And in reality, the science is you're comparing apples to oranges. That really what we're talking about is different types of testing methodology, each having their own benefits and each having their own limitations. But the really on this one is the time frame. Most drugs, let's take marijuana to the side for a moment in urine, maybe 72 hours, depending on where they're at, depends on the hydration level. So it's a really an indication a fairly recent use in general. And even marijuana, unless they're a very chronic user, you're going to get the same value on that. Hair 
because it takes time for the hair to grow out enough to be cut is probably, it can vary, seven to 10 days before, after the time of ingestion, before you could east, even clip it to begin with. So if someone, for example, has a positive hair and hasn't had any new ingestion, absolutely a urine would be expected to be negative. Controversially, if a urine is positive, but it was a one-off event, since it's really a lifestyle test, like Charlie mentioned, you would expect it to be negative. So most employers, in my experience, do not confuse the two, although many donors do. And the, the good science exists on that, that they should not. If they want to have an individual test, the hair test retested with the same portion, or a urine, part of the portion sent out from the same time frame, that's a lot, that depends on the employer policy, but it has nothing to do with the two different sample types. Gotcha. So, and I think you bring up some uh, some really good points with the, the reanalysis versus recollection. That's uh, pretty much industry standard. If the uh, donor doesn't agree with the results, there's a, a, a process that can be followed, whether it's urine or hair, to reanalyze that same sample so you're looking at the same time frame. So from a, a TPA's perspective, if, even if you look at positivity rates post-medical review, um, you know, we're, we're seeing between two and three times the positivity rate, probably closer to three times with a hair test versus a, a urine, and it makes sense, right? You're, you're looking at a, a longer time frame. So um, last question, uh, and Charlie, I'll, I'll uh, throw this one in your direction. Uh, as it pertains to cheating the test, uh, as they say, uh, there's a lot of uh, techniques and, uh, and what have you on the urinalysis side. Um, there's the desire to influence the outcome by the donor. I don't think it's any different for hair testing. How would you address that methodology? And does that in fact um, address the, uh, the issue that exists across the entire industry of cheating the test? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Brendan. Uh, a hair test is much more difficult to cheat. Uh, it's an observed uh, collection. Um, the, the way drugs are recorded in the hair uh, you can't substitute uh, somebody else's hair for your hair, uh, and it's it's almost impossible. Nothing's impossible. It's almost impossible to doctor uh, the sample of hair. So, pretty hard test to cheat. Thank you. I would like to uh, move to the next portion of the program and speak to uh, Chase McCourtney uh, about Form Fox and ECCF. Perhaps Chase, you could. Uh, Give us a real quick uh, rundown of what uh, FormFox provides, what ECCF means versus uh, the paper process, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Brendan. So one thing that you may not know is ECCF has actually been around for over 15 years at this point in time. Uh, the process that FormFox has developed is basically allows collectors to not need to rely on paper chains anymore. Our digital process is something that will guide collectors through the collection from beginning to end, and it's full of validations so that it's impossible to complete the test without filling out all the boxes, such as the temperature and range. It's gonna guide you to make sure that you capture the collector and the donor signature, and it really increases the accuracy and the speed of the whole process. One of the huge benefits that you receive from ECCF over a paper process is the amount of rework that is required when an error takes place in a paper process. So if you forget to sign the chain or you don't check a box, your chances of a fatal flaw skyrocket. With FormFox, we're gonna minimize those errors, which means at the end of the day, you're gonna be able to get your results in a quicker and more efficient fashion from your MROs. So this is something that we've been working on for over a decade and a half, and we've received quite a bit of adoption in the industry. There's over 5,000 clinics that are using FormFox today to allow their collectors to process drug tests electronically. And one thing to keep in mind is it's really easy to get started. All you need is a computer to be able to access our website or an iPad to be able to access our application in the App Store. What would you say to, to folks that say that that's nice that you have an electronic option, paper's not going anywhere, we're used to it, um, it's an option, but it, they don't see that taking over as the industry standard. What are, you, uh, what are your opinions on that? Yeah, so that's something that we hear quite a bit, actually, Brendan, and when we look at the data in the industry, 
we've noticed that even though ECCF has been around for the better part of 15 years, we only have about 50% of the drug collections across the industry being completed on a digital platform. So there's a ton of room to grow in this space. And one of the best ways to help us get there is to help our clinics be motivated to adopt the digital workflows. And the way we do that is by partnering together. So people like DISA on the TPA side have developed a very sophisticated portal called DISA Works that allows employers to engage with the digital ordering process. And if you think about ECCF adoption as a pyramid, the bottom rung of that pyramid is how we're going to be able to get people to do the tests electronically. The best way to do that is if it's pre-ordered in advance. So you as employers and TPAs really can help drive ECCF, ado ECCF adoption by placing more orders. If a donor shows up to a clinic with a paper chain, the chances of that clinic converting that paper chain to an electronic process are pretty slim to none. So while paper may not go away, we certainly can influence the clinics using an electronic platform, and it all starts with the order up front. Sounds like you guys have done a lot of work. This has been around for 15 years. Um, over the past few years, uh, cause the last two years, it seems like there's been a, a ton of development in this space. Can you kind of walk us through what you guys have done to increase that, that footprint uh, on a national level and make it more desirable for not only the customers, uh, but the, the collection facilities as well. Yeah, I'd love to. So even in 2020, with COVID really bringing things to a halt in many areas of the country, we've still been able to implement over 446 new clinics using FormFox just this year. In 2019, we did 546 clinics. So our digital footprint has expanded. In 2018, we added over 800 clinics. And in 2020, we're on pace to beat 2019, even with COVID happening. So a lot of people are worried that you may not be able to find a clinic that's using ECCF, especially in rural areas. But we have really worked hard over the last three years to close that gap. And our sales team and our implementation team has done a great job to do that. A few things that are also helping to make ECCF and FormFox more you know, adoptable or desirable for people to start using is our expanded menu of services. You know, it used to just be ECCF. Now you can do breath alcohol testing in FormFox, hair testing. We have a DOT physical exam workflow. We even developed a COVID-19 workflow as well as clinical blood draws, audiograms, respirator fits. So if we expand our paradigm and don't think of just ECCF as our only menu offering, we're really working hard to make sure that we have the workflows available that the employers are needing to have conducted at clinics in a digital fashion. Yeah, I can uh, just speak briefly, uh, specific to remote collections. Uh, we've worked with you guys for a number of years and we appreciate all the support. Uh, our mobile uh, collection site, if you will, uh, has been in the top five of all FormFox collection sites for a number of years. And they, they hover, uh, give or take a percentage point, around 80%. Uh, so that's um, that's something that uh, is impressive given the uh, environment that these guys are, uh, are in. Some of them are offshore, they're at refineries and blast, uh, blast pr uh, proof buildings. Uh, so some of the connectivity can be a challenge, but uh, it can certainly uh, be addressed in uh, most environments. Uh, as it pertains to, it sounds like uh, you guys have developed uh, some, some recent functionality. Uh, new new products. Uh, is there anything else on the horizon you guys are excited about that you're willing to, to share with the audience today? Yeah, absolutely. One of the next big developments in ECCF is going to be going truly paperless. Anyone that's using FormFox today knows that at the end of a drug collection, you still have to print lab copy one, you still have to put it in the bag and ship it to the laboratory. One of our main goals for 2021 in collaboration with our lab partners is to be able to go truly paperless for non-DOT collections. And we're gonna be doing that initially with CRL, Clinical Reference Laboratory. So that will eliminate the need to print the chain of custody and put it in the bag and send it to the laboratory. We will be able to send them all of the data in an electronic fashion so that when the sample arrives, they'll be able to accession it 
and get the results out in a very timely fashion. Okay, as it pertains to uh, the DOT Clearinghouse, uh, that's something that was, was new for everyone at the beginning of the year. Uh, can you speak to some of the uh, things that you guys have developed to, to help support that? Absolutely. So one thing that we've done as an industry, we've really collaborated with other electronic providers, TPAs, MROs, and laboratories. And we've come up with a convention uh, that is being adopted widely in the industry such that our system allows a collector to capture the driver's license up front, especially if the test is for FMCSA. We've built in validations into our system to know if it's a regulated account. If the reg mode is FMCSA, we prompt for a driver's license as well as an issuing state. And then we will print on the chain of custody in a concatenated fashion, which is just a fancy word for driver's license abbreviation in front of driver's license number that prints on the chain so that when it makes it to the MRO, they know the issuing state and they know the driver's license number so that if they have to do a donor interview, they have all the data that they need. It's important to keep in mind that at the end of the day, this is really an MRO reporting requirement and we at FormFox do not have the MRO, res MRO result to report to the clearinghouse. So our role is to help the collectors up front capture the necessary data elements so that the MROs can do their work efficiently. Thanks, Chase. Brandon, I don't have a question, but I'd like to play a little bit off of what Chase said, and I agree with everything he said. But one of the fabulous things of an ECCF system is really the striking reduction in collector errors that result in either a canceled test, a delayed test. Employers, TPA, and frequently donors have questions about it, and through the FormFox wizard, which I'm pretty familiar with, there will be prompts, particularly in difficult collection circumstances that don't happen every day. And what I have seen is, A, there's less of them because literally the collector gets prompted what to do next. So they understand what they say when there might be a refusal. And using an ECCF system really has far, far fewer Re rejected specimens, um, fatal flaws than would be otherwise using paper. So while I agree with Chase, paper's not going away entirely because there'll always be that circumstance, including co connectivity, it is a far, far better system to have a, a better outcome and have a proper collection which saves time, money, and questions about it. Thank you, Faith. Faith, you're up next. Let's, uh, let's discuss uh, CBD oil. This seems to be a Somewhat of a hot topic. I know uh, the medical review officer, return to duty, uh, hear all types of fabulous uh, stories about uh, CBD oil um, from some of our donors. Uh, could you give us a, a little bit uh, background, the differences maybe between CBD and THC, uh, and we'll kind of build from there. Okay, so let's talk about what's at the top of the, of the plant family, if you will, which is either you can call it marijuana, you can call it cannabis. Uh, depending where you're at, you're going to use one or the other, but they're the same thing. It's a plant. Botany gets to play in here. And the things we're going to talk about under these two topics are in the plant and the very geniuses of the plant, you're going to have cannabinoids, one of which we now abbreviate as CBD, cannabidiol. The one that you reference, THC, is tetrahydrocannabinol. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, there's lots of differences, but the biggest one is that THC has a psychoactive effect. And generally speaking, and this is a generalization, CBD does not. So, and under the federal government right now, cannabis or marijuana is illegal, absent anything else, all parts of it. So don't be confused. It's not just THC that's illegal. All of it is. So what has come about in the last, since actually 2013, is THC has always been illegal. Well, you know, yes, we've had some medical marijuana. Yes, we've had recreational. But there was a lot of states that started who didn't have medical marijuana who wanted to have CBD be legalized for certain purposes. And it caused a large political movement. Now, was that valid? 
not in the way it was done, but I will tell you, does it stop, is it CBD good for stuff? The FDA has approved um, Epidiolex, which is for seizures, which is pure CBD, indicating there are medical uses. So that's the two sort of parts of the plant. And they are very different. Labs do not mistake one for the other. They look for the metabolite of THEA or CBDA. So, but we're, so they're really two different things. And that has come on the, I'm going to call it market now, even though the legalization status has a lot to say about it. So that's where it starts, Brendan, as far as what sort of the background of it is. And the question that we always get is, what you referenced early on is the idea of a donor saying, I took CBD oil and that's what's causing my THC positive. And the question is, can that happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a recent study in the, in the fall of 2019, which is, this has not been studied a lot. So in the beginning that indicated 3.9% um, CBD oil that had 3.9% THC, which would roughly go to the 0.3% by dry weight, which I'll talk about in a minute, would, could cause a marijuana positive after a single use. So it is a definitely buyer beware scenario. Why does it matter if, from a legal point of view if it's not legal? Well, it gets a little complicated at the federal government level, I will tell you, because in December of 2018, there's a lot of reference to the Farm Bill, which descheduled hemp, hemp is a magic word here, that said if it, if it was, hemp was a product, it's a cannabis sativa, and if it contains less than 0.3% of THC by dry weight, it is no longer a Schedule One drug. So that's one of the issues. Now, what in the heck does that mean? We really don't know yet. That was an agricultural bill. That's talking about farmers and there's lots of restrictions. How does my CBD oil that I take from a pharmacy compare to what was done at the farm? Not a lot of correlation there. A lot of stuff coming out. But as of right now, CBD, well, hemp, which has less than 0.3% THC by dry weight that goes into market from a certified hemp farm is no longer a Schedule One drug, which causes then lots of questions legally about to do. I should probably point out that the vast bulk of CBD, which you can buy at Walgreens or your CBD store, is probably not certified hemp. And there has been no change in the status of that. So it is a bit mucky, I'll be honest with you, Brendan, to start out. But that's sort of the background to where we sit today on CBD oil. You know, as a consumer, if uh, the belief that CBD is, uh, is something beneficial to uh, the individual and they want to proceed with caution, but they do want to proceed, um, from, a, um, from the standpoint of it being regulated, and it sounds like there's little, if any, uh, regulation out there, any advice to that uh, potential consumer on what to look for, what to not look for, or is buyer beware uh, the current state? Well, it's more than just buyer beware. One of the studies has that looked at 85 CBD products. 65 of them were mislabeled. There is no regulation under what we're going to talk in the normal store for it. Uh, there are some minor exceptions under state licensing, but that's not the typical. You, they certainly can certify what they have, the manufacturer. They can even give you a certificate of analysis. But the FDA is not testing those. It's not like prescription medication. It's not like any of that. It is absolutely buyer beware. They truly don't know what they're buying. So it could have less CBD than they said. It also could be worthless and have nothing in it but, but frankly, MCT oil and not have anything. It can have far too much THC in it. It also, we don't know, frankly, how much, if you let, get less than 0.3% THC, let's imagine it has that. Typically, CBD is not a single-use drug. People are using it on an ongoing basis. Um, for what they perceive will help them, be it pain, be it anxiety, be it muscle ache. The list is, is, is longer than I could sit here and tell you today. But they need to have buyer beware. They also need to know their employer's policy on CBD 
usage and the employer's need to develop a policy when someone claims CBD usage. So it is a complex one, but it is, they have to proceed with caution. If someone is subject to drug testing, there is absolutely no guarantee what the outcome will be over time. And most states, employers do not have to accommodate it. Um, that's a complicated subject. But in general, unless it's hemp, the certified stuff, generally they won't. Also, it's the same analyte. So laboratories, connect, most laboratories do not test for CBD unless it's requested. Some do. That's, this is a changing scenario. But so the question is, if they show CBD and they show THC, and this is a developing science here, is the idea, and it's you know, still subject to things, if there's a whole, whole bunch of CBD, maybe it's more likely that's what it is. If there's a whole, whole bunch of THC, it's probably that. And then there's a vast range in the middle that you just don't know because analytically speaking, THCA is THCA, whether it comes out of the CBD bottle or whether it's smoked. Also, of course, you never know, are they using both? So it is developing. This is kind of breaking news. There are some broad brush things that are available out there. But in a large portion of circumstances, there's not going to be a great amount of analytical help to tell which is happening to help employers of what to do. So it is a tremendous conundrum at this state. We do not expect at this moment, the FDA has to do efficacy studies. There's, there's a whole bunch of things going on. My crystal ball on how fast the FDA moves is not great, but I will tell you the current estimate is up to five years because it's not just how to regulate it, but is it effective? It does, do the risks outweigh the, um, the dangers? I mean, and, and the benefits, it is a highly subjective. Do I think we'll get there? I do eventually, but not anytime soon. And the meanwhile, we have employers with THC positives that those will be the claims because it's quite easy to make that claim. So that's kind of where we're at in it, but it is a de very difficult and currently one of the most subjects of litigation and questions that employers have. Thank you, Faye. Yeah, I think we've, you've probably addressed this, but is there any other advice or guidance uh, to employers as it pertains to CBD? You mentioned uh, having it articulated in their written policy. Uh, you know, I'll open up to the, to the rest of the group. Is there sure. anything else, you know, I'll start with you, Faye, or if the group has anything else that they would like to add? Okay, so I advise a lot of employers on this. And the first issue is consider it. Don't put your head in the sand and wait. Because at the end of the day, we want employees to be drug free. And we don't want to do any gotcha. So if you're not going to accommodate CBD usage in any form, tell your employees that. Make that well and transparent because they won't be thinking that they can use CBD and maybe slide in a little THC, because really we want them to come to work drug-free. So that's the first issue you have to look at. Secondly, they have to assess their own risk. What type of work are these people doing? What type of things are happening? This is a larger conversation about cannabis in general, frankly, in the non-regulated workforce. They have to look at their own risk profile. I can't do that for them, but they have to really consider what they want to do about this and what they want to tell people. But whatever it is, the biggest one that they have to determine is to put it in the policy, publicize the policy, so we can keep drug use out of the workforce as very, very much as we can. I just wanted to jump in here and kind of add to what Faye was talking about. There was two, two kind of points that I was thinking about primarily is the FDA re regulations are going to be very important to understand exactly what is in these products because as Faye mentioned it is the wild wild west right now it could have nothing it could have way above the the legal level um, across the country and the other point that I wanted to talk about is DOT does have release guidance to medical ex uh, medical review officers to let them know that a marijuana positive on a DOT urine test is not or uh, well, CBD use is not a valid excuse for a positive. And so um, trying to educate, um, you know, particularly with the trucking industry, educating them about these products, the dangers of these products, um, and then letting them know it's not a valid excuse when they come up positive on a, on a urine test. 
Thank you, Abigail. I uh, wanted to spend just a few minutes about the DOT clearinghouse, maybe uh, some history as to, to, to how it built up uh, going into to 2020 and uh, some of the challenges you guys have, have seen with that. Um, so why don't you walk us through that? Excellent. I, I think kind of Chase kind of, you know, started us on this on this path of like where we're looking at in, in the use of the clearinghouse. And so, you know, from the American Trucking Associations, we have been advocating for a, a drug and alcohol, you know, repository of DOT violations since the mid 90s. Um, so we have been very excited that after almost 25 years of advocacy, we finally this year saw a clearinghouse um, go into effect. It had a bit of a bumpy start to, to put it nicely at the beginning, the system crashed, um, caused a lot of confusion early on. However, after a few weeks and a lot of phone calls with stakeholders, we finally have a, a system that is showing to be extremely effective. Um, what FMCSA has put forth, um, you know, what we are seeing is that it is helping to end the job hopping loophole that had existed for, for years, where there were individuals who were testing positive on a pre-employment um, DOT drug test were just going to another company and ending up testing negative and not you know, telling their next employer that they're actually prohibited from operating. So FMCSA, with the clearinghouse being in effect since January 6th, they've been releasing these monthly updates of what is in, um, how many violations are in there, and it's a little mind-blowing. Uh, there, there's over 40,000 DOT drug and alcohol violations currently in there. One kind of great part of it is that over half of them are pre-employment drug tests. So what we are finding from our membership is that you can use um, querying the system for a, you know, for a dollar 25, you're able to see whether this person has violated, you know, the DOT regs and, and carriers are catching people. Surprisingly, people are consenting and they're finding out they're actually in a prohibited status. status. Um, what, what's also really great about this system is that it's also tracking people's rehabilitation. Um, that is one thing that we had not seen before. Um, we did not know what, you know, how many lapses, how many people were out there continuing to drive. Um, what we have found is that of those like 40,000 violations, about 3,400 have done a negative, had a negative return to duty test and are no longer in a prohibited status. So they have not completed those follow-up tests, but this is exactly what you know our industry wants to see is that the enforcement of these regulations and and the clearinghouse has been a, a great example um, now the cost is increased but one of one of the benefits is that they can check the clearinghouse for a low price and if the person is prohibited they don't have to run the full background <laughs> screen which sorry you know is not or run the the dot drug test or run the hair test that they want to do which saves a tremendous amount of money and is you know great from a liability perspective of knowing that information. Thank you. I mentioned hair testing. Uh, can you give us some insight? Are you guys seeing uh, a pattern of DOT regulated uh, em employers supplement their urinalysis under DOT with a non-DOT uh, hair testing program? If so, can you give us a little insight there? We have definitely seen some of the, the largest carriers within the industry have adopted hair testing as part of their pre-employment screening process. What is a little disappointing and the reason why we've been advocating for federal acceptance of hair testing since 2008 is that some of the smaller companies have just not um, felt that they could do it from a cost benefit perspective. And so there are a tremendous amount of carriers that would like to do hair testing but the additional cost has been a little cost prohibitive. Um, but the carriers that are doing hair testing are seeing a significant benefit. They're seeing their random rates being reduced. Um, they're seeing their post accidents rates going down to zero. Um, we have seen a little bit of an uptick, which has been a little interesting. You know, people who, uh, well, carriers 
that have been doing hair testing for years have seen one or two post accidents and it's the drug that probably no one would be surprised to be in there it's marijuana um, so they've started a, a few very proactive carriers have started to do some more random hair testing um, but you know hair testing is definitely seen as a, a, a very effective safety tool. Uh, thank you. So from a, a regulatory standpoint, can you maybe give us some insight on uh, the current state or, or more importantly, maybe some things that are on the horizon that you can share with us? Yeah, um, there, you know, ATA, we've been supportive of having alternative specimens included into DOT's drug testing program. Um, oral fluid testing is definitely one of them, one of the great aspects of oral fluid testing that has been approved by HHS um, is, is that it's observed collection. It's, it's going to be great. Um, we were hoping to see DOT issue a notice of proposed rulemaking to incorporate oral fluid into DOT's program this year. Um, I think COVID and um, all of the waivers and exemptions and guidance that had to come out very quickly back in March and April um, kind of slowed down the regulatory process a bit. So I am still hopeful that, you know, by the end of the year, we'll see a rule come out um, and, and to, to see it get incorporated quickly. I do suspect that DOT hopes to um, finalize oral fluid testing when they update the, the, the chain of custody form, which is October of 2021. So that, that's kind of like the, the highlight there that um, you know, oral fluid testing is going to be so great in post-accident. Um, observe collection, you're not going to get, it's going to be much better, much more effective, um, reasonable suspicion, it's going to be an effective tool. Hair testing, uh, back in 2015, there was a federal mandate for um, HHS to create uh, scientific and technical guidelines. Um, we're still waiting on those for DOT to incorporate um, into, their, into their program, um, but we're very hopeful that that will move forward um, you know, within the next few years. Thank you very much. Uh, last question for you, and I'll uh, defer to Chase. He may have uh, some input as well. We talked to, to Chase, uh, obviously, with Forum Fox, and we talked about the electronic workflows. Uh, for non-DOT, both drug and alcohol are available. For DOT, the drug testing electronic uh, process was, is available uh, for, for, on the drug testing side, but not yet on the alcohol testing side. Uh, do you have any insight on when they may allow alcohol testing for DOT as it pertains to ECCF? Yeah, that's a great question. We get asked that all the time. Uh, keep in mind, it took 15 years from the first conversations between the feds and the industry experts to get ECCF approved for federal urine collections. So while we continue to stay close to ADAPSI on this topic, there we don't really have any line of sight at this point to when they will approve alcohol testing. Um, there are certainly things that we can do, however, in the meantime to influence this. Um, Basically, what we are saying is we interpret that since we don't have clear line of sight and they haven't come out and given us any dates, maybe that just simply means that we all aren't contributing and collaborating enough or making enough noise for that to happen. So we would, you know, as we are discussing our network of clinics and employers and TPAs, we kind of all play a role in helping to influence and push this digital BAT process. I will say since we haven't got approval from the federal government yet for a DOT workflow for BATs, we've developed at FormFox what we call the DOT BAT event capture. And what this means is TPAs that have integrated their systems with us, like an ordering portal, can order a regulated breath alcohol test and FormFox will prompt the technician to do that BAT on the paper ATF, just like they normally would. And just a few months ago, we designed the ability for the collector to scan and upload that paper ATF, or they can take a picture with their iPad, just like you would if you're depositing a mobile a check into your bank from your mobile phone. So you can take a picture of the ATF and upload it into FormFox, and we will transmit that back to the party that ordered it so that they'll have a digital image of the actual paper ATF. 
and they can enter the results into FormFox. So while it doesn't substitute doing it on paper, it simply and certainly expedites getting the results back to the person who ordered the test. So we're seeing great adoption of that in the field. Okay, thank you. Sounds like a good workaround for the, for the meantime. Yeah, for the time being, for sure. Uh, so we've mentioned, uh, you know, COVID-19 a few times uh, during the session. That certainly has changed the landscape of uh, the collection site community. Uh, Christina, from, from Quest perspective, what would you say to uh, employers who are concerned about using collection sites uh, owned by Quest or uh, maybe a third party site that's in your network? What measures have you guys taken uh, since COVID-19 to ensure the safety? So we've heard the concern quite a bit, totally understand it and definitely have taken quite a few safety measures um, to mitigate those risks to help employers and employees feel comfortable. Um, so Quest Station Services Centers have put out a program they call the Peace of Mind Program. The Peace of Mind Program dedicates and reserves the first hour of business each morning to those over the age of 60 or anyone with an underlying health condition to kind of ease their concern of having a lot of people in the collection site at one time or being exposed to COVID. The second thing that they've put into place, um, collectors are required to wear full PPE, that's gloves, masks, shields, and lab coats. Um, we also require that donors wear face masks in order to be serviced. The collection sites have rearranged their waiting areas to allow for social distancing, and there's also several sanitizing, hand sanitizing stations around. So when you go in and you have to use the kiosk to um, sign in, there's hand sanitizer right there. And there's also an employee that will wipe that keyboard down um, after every, um, uh, every donor comes in and signs in. Um, there's also a program that they put into place where if you are uncomfortable waiting in the waiting area, um, they'll give you a beeper. So it's like a wait by text option so that you can wait outside in the fresh air if you choose, or you can wait in your vehicle if you'd like for your appointment time. And then lastly, what a lot of patient service centers have moved towards is by appointment only. And so this helps reduce the number of, of individuals at the collection site at one time, and it helps them adhere to social distancing guidelines, as well as allows them time to disinfect in between each patient and donor. As it pertains to uh, third-party sites that you guys may leverage in your uh, network, uh, do you hold them to the same standards? How do you monitor uh, the, those facilities that aren't technically owned by Quest? Quest Diagnostics' expectation is that all preferred and third-party sites in the network are following all federal, state, and local safety guidelines and restrictions um, in those specific areas. But we do encourage clients to reach out to those specific sites that they want to send employees to um, to ask about the safety protocols that they have in place so that there's no surprise for the donor. You guys uh, offer mobile options for some of your customers? Uh, if so, kind of walk me through the logistics and, and how you facilitate that. Sure. So we do have a large mobile collection network. Um, there's about 6,000 plus mobile collection, mobile collectors um, that are available 24-7. And so those can be conducted in 24-7 events, such as an emergency event for a post-accident, um, or they can be scheduled as on-site collection events. Uh, and what would you say to employers uh, who would prefer the mobile option or um, but think it's cost prohibitive? So we do hear that a lot, but we, we feel the benefits far outweigh the cost. So... So if you were to have a mobile collection event, it would ensure compliance with your drug testing programs because you could schedule those in advance and have the collector arrive um, to complete those collections um, for those donors in your program, whether it be a random program or your pre-employment. It also increases productivity as multiple donors can be um, tested at one time. So it's less time away from their job responsibilities. And it also ensures access um, continued access to our collection sites. So we're not sending large groups of donors into collection sites for testing. One item uh, or one area I'd like to have you speak to briefly 
Uh, obviously, we, uh, we have already uh, spoken with Chase. They are uh, uh, vested in, in growing the uh, footprint of sites that are ECCF enabled. Uh, when customers reach out to, uh, to Quest, uh, is there a process to, uh, to build out additional sites within the network? Uh, to go from paper to electronic, and how do you guys uh, press forward with those? Sure. So the collection services team is a team of about six individuals who are always preaching the benefits of ECCCF um, any chance that we get. So um, any leads that come in, um, we pretty much require those collection sites in order to be onboarded that they have to agree to perform collections electronically. Um, so that allows us to, uh, to bring on those valuable sites um, especially in areas that are a challenge where we where we need coverage. Um, so um, anyone can reach out to Quest and provide a lead. Um, and if it's needed, we'll take a look through and um, and get them set up on ECCS. Uh, any advice or guidance to employers uh, who want to add new sites for their employees to use uh, or select a, a partner long term? Uh, any guidance you would uh, provide for them? To that employer? Sure, so, so we've increased our, our network by about 2,500 sites this year, um, but we're always looking for new collection sites to partner with. You always have those remote areas um, where, where coverage is lacking, and so um, we encourage them. If you've got a site that you want to use, um, definitely send us the information and we will reach out to them and, and work to bring them on board. Thank you. Um, open it up to the group. Any other uh, questions or comments specific to uh, collection sites that you guys would like to, uh, to add? I have a quick question. I know that um, very early on with COVID-19, there was a lot of employers were listening to their drivers about being very concerned. And so they cut back on, on the, the pool and kind of held on to the names for random testing. So I, I have a question of how is, um, are you seeing a large amount of randoms coming in now is to kind of a, a surge of trying to meet their regulatory obligation by the end of the year? The surge has begun. <laughs> we are seeing that, yes, um, they're scrambling to try and get the randoms, uh, the randoms in um, November, not so much in October, but coming in November, there's a lot scheduled. A lot of on-site random events are scheduled. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to thank each and every one of you guys for participating today. Uh, I know your time is incredibly valuable. Uh, so we uh, uh, appreciate the partnership and uh, we're really uh, glad to, to have you here today. And um, I appreciate all the feedback. Good session, Brendan. Thank you Thanks, for allowing Charlie. the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.